Welcome back to Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. He is the mayor for the city of Wetaskiwin in central Alberta, Mayor Tyler Gandam. Mayor, your worship, Tyler, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. <laughs> I appreciate you having me on. I have asked the same question to every political guest that I've had on this show. You're no exception. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? For me, it was, I love my community. I love my city. Uh, I moved here when I was about 10 years old from Vancouver. My mom's originally from Wetaskiwin. Uh, my thought when we got moved to a city of 10,000 people is as soon as I turn 18, I'm moving back to Vancouver because how dare you move me to such a small community? And I absolutely fell in love with it. So I love the community. I love the city. My mom and dad taught me fairly early, um, not so much a duty to serve, but just giving back and being engaged and involved in the community. And I think this is just one of the things that I felt I was going to be able to do for the city. And, and honestly, and selfishly for myself too, it's, it's pretty rewarding work uh, being involved within the community at a, at a level like this. You, you could have given back in many different ways, as you just stated, whether it be nonprofit volunteerism. I know you are, you are on the fire uh, uh, department as well in the city of Wetaskiwin. But in 2013, you decided that you would take the leap into municipal politics. I want to stick with the first election that you won. And I want to ask, was there an issue in the city of Wetaskiwin that on your mind, you believe that you were the best to advocate for around the city council ta table? So for me, I, I felt or I knew that I wanted to run for council eventually, and I didn't think it was going to be in 2013. Um, but the way that I saw how council operated, I didn't, I didn't personally like it. Um, if you voted yes on something, I voted no because you voted yes, not because of whatever the issue was. Uh, some of the antics that were going on within council chambers, I felt were completely disrespectful and I could sit on the sidelines and complain about it or I could get involved and, and try to change the dynamics of, of what council looked like. And so that was the reason I ran in 2013. There wasn't any specific uh, issue. There wasn't a, a hot topic going on within the community. It was wanting to represent the community better. And I, I felt that I could be a part of that. Being elected is a unique experience. And you're one of the few people in your city who have been able to sit around that council table and make decisions that will affect the day-to-day -day lives of your neighbors, your uh, local grocery store clerk, uh, your post office, the, your postman. Um, Walking into that council chambers for the first time as an elected official, what weight was on your shoulders? Because the decisions you made are going to affect the day-to-day -day lives of your neighbors. How much of a weight was that for you? Tons. And it was completely overwhelming. Um, I'd, I'd attended a couple of council meetings before that. I, and we didn't, I mean, we weren't live streaming then. We didn't have video recordings of council meetings. So my knowledge of what a council meeting looked like, or even just the dynamics within that council. I, I remember one of the first questions I asked the mayor was, okay, so when I vote, do I, does it matter? Like if I vote with my left hand, is it the same as vote? Like, does it count? Cause I didn't vote with my right hand. Like I, I honestly had very little understanding of what it meant to be a member of council. For me, it was what can I do in my community and how can I best bring about some change and, and my um, idea from the beginning was changing the culture of the city. I feel like we're our own worst enemy. And I feel like if I can be the biggest cheerleader from a position on council, I can help change the culture of what this city looks like. So there was a ton of weight on my shoulders. A lot of that was put on my shoulders by myself in the high expectations of what I felt I was going to be able to do. And like, I'll probably guarantee 99.9% .9 of every elected official who got elected thought that they were going to come in here and set the world on fire and, and make all these wonderful changes. And the previous councils didn't know what they were talking about. And yeah, it, the, the process that goes into making the decisions and why it takes so long and why it's, it's at a snail's pace is understandable because of all the work that goes into those decisions. 
it's not just hearing that this is what we're working on this week and next week we're going to have x y and z done because we're council we can do absolutely everything we we've got the power to make those decisions and we just don't and it's because of the the level of um, expertise our administration has going out into other fields to find out what our best practices, why we should be doing what we're doing is a big part of those decision-making. And I got a little bit of off topic there, but for sure. No, but uh, you're, you're, you're opening up Pandora's box and I like it because <laughs> I want to know um, as you kind of mentioned it there, but I'm going to sort of peel back this bandaid a little bit, if you don't mind. As an elected official, that first term, you're right. You go in there, you're expecting to change the world overnight and things are going to be completely different. But you have to then come to the realization that you're one vote on council and the issues that are important to you may not be important to your fellow councillors. So at what point in time did you realize that things don't happen overnight and I'm, I, I have to not only work to advocate for the issues that I believe are important, but I also have to work with my fellow councillors to better the city and not just the people that voted for me. Absolutely. I, I think I found out pretty early because not only did I come to the table with changes that I wanted to see happen within Wetaskiwin, but also there's been things that have been going on for years that council has been working on that now administration is bringing to a new council. We had four new members of council my first term. So now you're bringing four members of council up to speed, um, what they're working on, why they're working on it, and why those items take priority or precedence over whatever you thought you were coming into council chambers to work on. And there, everybody's got capacity. And I would say that our administration has been operating well beyond their capacity for at least the nine years that I've been on council. So it's incredibly slow and a lot of times incredibly frustrating. But then, man, you get that, that one change or something happens within your community that you just you totally forget about all the frustrations you had before and it, it all is really clear as to why you're there and just re-energizes you again after four years sitting on council you decide to move up in the world of municipal politics and you decide in 2017 you're going to run for mayor um uh, going back to that original question of what was the decision behind running for council what was the decision behind moving up and deciding I'm, I'm going to run for mayor in this, uh, this election in 2017. So uh, my mayor at the time, Bill Elliott, had been on council, I think, for 26 or 27 years, um, coming to the end of his term, his second term as mayor. And for about two years before that happened, he would um, either point things out to me or, or take me aside and say, okay, so when you're mayor... This, these are the things you should focus on. These are the things, you know, that aren't, aren't nearly as important as somebody would have you think. And I'm like, no, I'm, okay, I'm not going to be mayor. I'm, that's, to me, that was going to be a retirement job for me to be able to kind of dedicate as much time as I could. I was still working full-time uh, managing a funeral home. I, there was no way I could do both. So if I was running for mayor, I would have to give that other life up which I loved so much. It was, again, serving the community in a different capacity. So for two years or two years prior to the election, hearing that when you're mayor, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I was like, nope, it ain't happening. And then about a year before the election, it was like, okay, so maybe, maybe when I'm mayor, I can, I can work on this or I can, I can do that. And I, I've, loved, I've loved every bit of it. And it is totally different. This, the, the learning curve that you get when you get elected to council is pretty steep. And even being on council for a term, the learning curve for being the mayor is 10 times harder. And thankfully, I've got, again, amazing administration, a, a super supportive and a fantastic council in both of my terms that I've been the mayor, because you can't do it alone. And no matter what people think that the mayor's got all this power and they just wave the magic wand and make things happen. And it just, it doesn't happen like that. And thankfully, because if I had the power that people thought I'd have, and I'd have a hundred times the phone calls I get in a day trying to, to change the things that they feel that either the mayor or council can do. And we're, we're governance, we're, we're budget, we're policy. We're not in the day-to-day the -day of why wasn't 
my street cleared, but the street over was right. We don't we don't direct those sorts of things, and and thankfully we don't direct those sorts of things. So how do you balance that? Because municipal politics is a, is is an interesting level of government because. You, you can't go to the grocery store without people knowing who you are. If you're an MLA or an MP, people may see you from time to time in the grocery store if you're in that community. But as mayor, you go to any place in your community, people are going to know you are the mayor. So how do you balance that aspect of life? Because you're right, you get comments and questions about everything you do at council. So how do you balance the need to engage with your constituents, but also have a private life and personal life as well? Um, I, I don't, I don't mind it. I don't, when somebody comes and will will talk to you or have questions about city operations, doing so respectfully, I have all the time in the world. Um, it's the times that I'm in the middle of having a meal or I, the worst one probably is attending a funeral and being there as, as, one of the mourners and somebody says, you know, this probably isn't the right time, but, and then starts talking about a city issue. And I said, you're right. This isn't the right time. Uh, You can call my office, you can email me, uh, but we're not talking about this right now. So I think that having the ability to set those boundaries is really important. And it depends on the person. Some people don't want to have their personal life interrupted in the middle of um, supper out or, you know, going to the movie or doing whatever, but I, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I really enjoy. Are people respectful? Really here. Most times, like the majority of time, very seldom is somebody ever coming at me sideways and I'm confident enough, I guess maybe is the, the best way to put it to, to shut that down. And I don't mind it. You don't have to like me. I'm okay with that. And truthfully, one of the hardest things about being the mayor is the decisions that get made, you might not support Um, and it might not be popular within the community and people think differently of you or you lose friendships or relationships change based on being a member of council. And it's, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's a reality of, of the role that you take on. Has it become easier for you after almost nine years on council to say no to constituents? Because every constituent will believe that their issue is the most important issue. And to them, it is. And I worked at a municipality before, and I know the range of questions and issues that people have. As a municipal council, as mayor, as councillor, you have to look at the bigger picture. You have to look at it as the city and not just what's best for the person. And you have to say no sometimes. Has it become easier to say no to people with an explanation of why you're telling them no? That's the big part of it is the explanation. And most times for me, it's not telling somebody no. It's giving them the avenue to bring their either issue or question or concern forward and helping them understand that it's a it's a decision of council. It's not the decision of one member of council. And I'm also not going to bring your issue forward. If you want changes done, if you want policies changed, if you want a bylaw changed, here are the avenues to bring it to council to have that happen. I'm not going to bring that on your behalf. Uh, I still feel like the more involved and engaged a community, a community can be and its residents, I think that's how you get a healthier community and, and just a way better understanding of what role a member of council has. You talked in your earlier statement about the culture of the city that you wanted to change when you were elected. You've been on council now for nine years. How's that change going? <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not as easy as I thought it might be. I'm, Why not? I, like everybody else, I can blame COVID for part of it. I, COVID I hate is, as an excuse for anything, but We were disconnected for so long. The social events weren't happening. Families didn't have the opportunity to get together like they should have or could have. Um, Funerals didn't happen. Birthdays didn't happen. Like the celebrations weren't happening. And people, it took everything out of a lot of people to just get through that, let alone give that little bit extra back to the community. And I think that, again, the more engaged and the more involved your residents are and business owners are in your community, the stronger and healthier it is. So I think we need to get back to that and get back on track with that. Are you uh, seeing we, a silver lining? Or, because we are yeah. out of the, I, I say we're out of the pandemic. We are removing mandates as of uh, recording this. Are people of Wetaskiwin finally engaging again and getting out to these uh, 
open events that people or, or your community is having? Yeah, so we had a, a taste of a task one last Friday night and the organizers were struggling. So a week before, they weren't getting the ticket sales. And that's pretty typical in Wetaskiwin. We're, uh, we're a last minute, hey, that sounds like a good idea. I didn't want to commit to it a week ago, but yeah, I'll get tickets for it now. And it nine times out of 10, it works out. The, the event goes off. It's a, it's a success or it's successful. It's well attended, but it's extremely stressful for the organizers because they don't have the tickets sold two days before the event. So this one was no exception. The organizers were getting stressed out about not getting the ticket sold. And I said, it'll be fine. It'll work itself out. People will come. And I didn't realize it was this close or this bad, but they had, a, they had 500 tickets and they sold 250 of them the day of the event. So they, they ended up selling the event out. The event was a huge success. Everybody had a great time, but didn't, it wasn't looking like that at 10 o'clock Friday morning when the event started at seven o'clock Friday night. So yeah, I think they are. And I, I think even just any community in general is starting to see more engagement, more social activities and remembering what it feels like to be around people again and how good it feels. We talked about it just before uh, we started airing or recording here is that I was at Alberta Municipalities Convention last week and had the opportunity to reconnect with a bunch of mayors and members of council and administration that I hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, and it feels really good to be back with, with people who you share, whether it's work or um, hobbies, whatever it is, it just, it's really good. And I think you'll see that back in the communities again, uh, remembering what it feels like to be at a, a you know, the, the moose puts on a steak dinner or the legions doing some kind of event, just getting back to, to, to that gets us back on track on remembering why we do a little bit extra in our communities. Strategic Steps works with local municipalities, boards, and school divisions across Canada, providing guidance and expertise in governance, strategy, and sustainability. They work with clients to build on existing strengths, develop recommendations that are practical, sustainable, and strategic, and lead professional development sessions that drive organizational excellence and council and board member growth. From strategic planning to organizational and governance reviews to governance workshops and more, Strategic Steps has the tools, experience, and expertise to help your organization reach its goals and set itself up for future success. To book a consultation or learn more about Strategic Steps Incorporated, visit strategicsteps.ca today. I want to turn now to the city of Wetaskiwin. And before I do that, I want to preempt this question with this statement. This is a conversation between myself, the host of the Cross Border Interviews, and the mayor. This is not a decision by council. This is just his opinion, and this is just about him. Because I, I want to make people aware that this is not a council decision. This is your opinion. And my question to that is, in your opinion, Mayor, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Wetaskiwin today? I would say I think our crime rate hurts our ability to grow. And for the most part, most people in the city are safe, but we have a smaller population. We see some more significant crime here, which affects our crime severity index, which on paper makes us look like a dangerous city. And McLean's loves to, to publish it and have for a number of years, the Wetaskiwin's Alberta's most dangerous city, which if you talk to the majority of the residents here would disagree wholeheartedly. So for sure, our crime rate is probably one of our big, are probably our biggest issue, and which goes along with that is our uh, homelessness, and so the mental health and the addictions that goes along with that also plays into that crime severity index as well as people feeling safe in their community. I, I can say that and this is not speaking at a turn, but I've been to Wetaskiwin a few times just through my travels and through my travels of across Alberta, and I've never felt. Uh, in danger. I've never felt in harm in the city of Wetaskiwin. So I can, I can understand as mayor, uh, seeing a report like that through McLean's must hurt the, um, the standing of the community in the general public. So how do you battle back against that? What is council doing to say, 
we aren't the crime, the highest crime rate in Alberta. We, we have crime just like every other community, but we're just trying to deal with it in our own way. Yeah. And so, and by statistics, we are Alberta's most dangerous city, right? So take that for whatever you will. Uh, one of the things that we've done to combat that is uh, reaching out to our Minister of Justice uh, at the time was Minister Schweitzer asking for help from the province. Uh, and it, again, through COVID, not being able to get in front of ministers, share our issues, share our problems, um, came down to a phone conversation with him. And he's like, okay, so what can we do to, to help you? And I... <laughs> I don't know. Like, I didn't know what the difference is going to be. And, and not that we're going to police our way out of this, but I said, give us 10 RCMP members. We, we have the highest criminal code calls for service per member. Our members are responding to more calls than any other municipality in the province per capita. Help us with that. Get that number down so that we can be more proactive with our policing instead of reactive. And we'll go from there. And so again, I didn't hear back from the ministry for a number of months. Uh, there was a cabinet shuffle. Minister Madhu was now the new um, Minister of Justice. So again, reached out, uh, had a really good meeting with him. And again, laid it out to him. This is, this is what our community is facing. And this is why I feel we're not able to grow or why we're struggling as a municipality. Um, Again, do you have your own asked. RCMP detachment within Wetaskiwin? Yeah. yeah. How's your relationship with the staff sergeant there? Uh, we have an inspector. Inspector, so ins sorry. Uh, yes. I had a great, great relationship with the inspector. He had just, he just transferred out. So we'll be getting a new one right away. But he was here for almost six years. Have a great relationship with him. And again, the, the police were reactive. They, they couldn't be proactive. So again, meeting or uh, talking with Minister Madhu, this is what we need and why. Uh, that I got a phone call a couple of months later and I could have cried. He, like, he gave us 10 RCMP members on a three-year pilot project at no cost to the municipality, no cost to the city, no cost to the county. And let's reassess this in three years and see if this was, if this has made a difference. And I mean, just RCMP presence within the community. If, if you were, up to no good, you see an RCMP member a lot more often now than you ever did before. And, and I don't know if our crime stats are going down or not. I know that the level of service has definitely increased for, for our community, as well as with the city or with the county with Tasquin as well. Our inspector of the day uh, started a crime reduction unit, which just focused on um, repeat offenders. And that they that would come and go depending on the number of members he had available. So he'd have to break the team apart. They'd go back to the watch, whereas before they could go after um, uh, just um, curfew checks, um, checking on. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. No worries, but I, I want to follow yeah. up on this uh, on this for a second here because. Um, this is an issue that I've heard a lot in this series that I'm putting together. Rural crime and crime in general is a big thing right now. And I'm not comparing it because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the issues that came with that, with mental health and a lot of uh, homelessness issues. Um, prior to the pandemic, was this an issue as well? Or is this something that's been coming out of the pandemic? No, our, we were Alberta's most dangerous city statistically prior to covid Okay. Um, how marketing a community like yours when that is your kind of unofficial title because you've said it a few times already, how do you do that? How do you market people to say, come to our city, come live in here because it is a great place to uh, live, work and play because I can imagine it is hard to try to diversify the economy, bring economic drivers to the community when you have the highest crime rate in Alberta. Yeah, I think you just focus on the positives that we have here. We have got an amazing recreation center. The people here are outstanding. We've got a lower level of income um, on average within the province and consistently are top five in donations per capita. So if you've got a lower social economic community and you can rank 
within the top five in Alberta with some of the richer communities that we've got in Alberta. That says a lot about the people that we have here. Uh, social media has definitely helped with um, posting something. They've got a problem. They, they need help with food. They need help with just moving a couch or getting a car boosted, whatever it happens to be. And you've got people commenting on there immediately. How can I help? Where are you at? Send me a private message. I'll be over there right away. Our people here are absolutely amazing and will literally give you the shirt off their back to help you out. And so when you've got a community like that, for the ones that live here and the ones that can share those positive experiences, that's how you market your community. You want to be a part of this community. And this is why we've got great people here. We've got smaller classroom sizes. Our uh, average house cost is lower here. There's a number of, of reasons why Wetaskiwin is, is or should be a consideration for when you're moving or leaving your community. And definitely people is, is number one. If while the crime issue is not going away tomorrow, if you could wave a magic wand and fix it tomorrow, what would be the priority for the city next? Because while that is something that's always going to be going on, councils can't just rely on one issue to move forward. They have to work on many different issues. What's the mm -hmm. next big issue in the city of Wetaskiwin that council's trying to uh, fix right now or overcome? A aging infrastructure. We're a community of uh, we're 100 and my math isn't good on the spot 117 years old 116 years old we did a downtown revitalization 10 years ago and they were pulling um pipes out of the ground that were still wood and clay that were being used so the infrastructure here for sure roads sidewalks underground infrastructure is something that we're so far behind on that we're trying to play catch up with if, if I'm waving a magic wand, uh, we look after our infrastructure and just the community aesthetically looks better. How, well, how do you pick and choose what infrastructure projects the council has to work on? While you have to rely on administration to tell you which ones they believe is a priority, um, things happen. Uh, yeah. Everyone knows that accidents happen and pipe, uh, pipes burst and water mains break and we have to fix them. So how does a council, uh, when you have an aging infrastructure, pick and choose who the winner and losers are when it comes to infrastructure at the end of the day? See, and that's the beauty thing about being on council is we're not picking and choosing the product projects. We shouldn't be picking and choosing the projects because then that becomes a political decision and not what's in the best, best interest of the city. So I rely on my administration who have way more knowledge and experience when it comes to underground infrastructure, um, the failing, what's failing quicker, either the road above or the, the underground infrastructure. And what do we need to change? What are we changing now so that we don't have an emergency this winter and it costs us twice as much to do it and it becomes a way bigger headache. So I rely on my, my uh, administration to tell me what the priorities are and, and they set those. As soon as you make it a political decision by council, it's either who's, who's the loudest in the community that feel that they should have their roads and sidewalks redone or, and not that it would ever happen, but I've, I've heard that maybe it would. Uh, a member of council street gets repaved or new sidewalks because they have the ability to make that decision, which is exactly why it should be left to administration and not being a political decision. How important is it to have a good relationship with your CAO? Because I, I, as I've said on this show numerous times over the last week and a half of airing Municipal Month, the CAO is technically your only employee as council. You do not have the right as council to go in and direct the planning and development to rezone a certain parcel of land because your role is to direct the CAO who will direct administration. How important is it to have a good working relationship as the mayor with your CAO? huge and not just for the mayor but for council as a whole to have a, a good relationship with your CAO trust is is crucial uh, you have to trust them and they have to trust you and if you want them to make you look good you have to make them look good as well uh, we had so our CAO has been in place now for a year and a half permanently uh, she had she was an acting CAO prior to that um, and as a new mayor five years ago I didn't understand the importance of that relationship with the CAO. So I don't like to bother people. I'd come into city hall, I'd get my work done and I'd leave. Like I'm not even stopping in and saying hi or doing anything like that. I just, I, people were busy. I didn't want to interrupt them. I carried on and I didn't, didn't have a strong relationship with previous CAOs. 
and I'm I've learned now how important that is. Uh, my CAO and I have a, a fantastic relationship. Her and I were disagreeing about something, uh, and I can't even remember what it was. We're disagreeing about something, and she I I was going by this is what we've always done, and she's going by no this is policy. So. She and not not that it's a win or lose, but she wins that policy dictates how we do things, right? And so she was concerned that us disagreeing about something damaged might might have damaged our relationship. And I laughed and I said, the fact that we've been working together for over a year and this is our first disagreement about something, <laughs> our our relationship is far better and far stronger than you and I having a disagreement about whatever it happens to be. And you're right. Policy will absolutely dictate how we're going to do things and getting out of the habit of, well, this is how we've always done it. So we're just going to keep doing it this way is so archaic. And the more we can get away from that, the better, right? We've got policies in place. We've got practices, procedures, and it covers our butts. We don't have to worry about, well, you did it this way Tuesday, and now you're changing it for Friday. Whereas when you follow your policy, there's no gray area, you know what's going on, and everybody's on the same page. So I'm, I'm really, really fortunate. And again, getting to work with other municipalities, um, either through Alberta municipalities, my role as a director and a VP for cities under 500,000, or even just being at conventions or attending mid-city mayor meetings, I would say that the majority of those that I get to work with recognize how strong a relationship that Sue and I have and, and envy or or are are jealous a little bit of, of the level of relationship that we can have. You have seen councillors come and go in your time and new councillors get elected. Um, as mayor, is that one of the first things you have to remind new councillors that while it, you think you're coming in here to change the world and dictate what's going to go on, you have to go through the proper channels. You have to follow policy and policy dictates. We, uh, we, direct the CAO to do this and then yeah. he or she would direct the uh, administration. 100% and legislation through the MGA says that you have to be offered council 101 training and so they cover that really early on in your term and I think it's really important that whether you're a first term member of council or that you've been doing this for 30 years having that refresher on what your role is on council because you can get complacent or you get really comfortable like it would be really easy for any of our members of council to reach out to a staff member or to the CAO and, you know, like little encouragement or a little whatever, but that's not our role. And that's, I think, a really dangerous line to cross. Again, whether you're a first term counselor or you've been around forever, that reminder that this is your role, you've got budget, you've got governance, you're in charge of policy, stay in your lane and build that relationship and trust with your administration and everything will go as well as it possibly can. I, I just love the fact that you just said uh, in uh, 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 answer a little bit beforehand that policy always will outweigh, we did it the way, we did it that way last week or we did it that way always. So no, policy is the one thing you have to look at. How important is it for you to always be looking at those policy as mayor? Um. It either always looking at it, having a good understanding of it, or again, having a really strong administration that not only understands the policy, but is also strong enough to say to council, uh, no, we can't, we can't do that as per policy, whatever. This is how we do things. And a big reason why setting policy that's crystal clear or as best as you can, um, so that you always have that to fall back on too. If it's, gray or or not clear or concise it's it leaves room for you to get yourself into trouble and not just individually but as a municipality as a whole well hello this is your friendly host of the cross-border interviews with chris brown i have some big news for you i am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with strategic steps incorporated to launch a brand new show on october 19th the political trenches local government at work is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments, and we will have a 
roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the news show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into the political trenches. I want to turn to my last segment of the show because I'm just looking at the time and I'm cautious of it. Um, I want to talk about the city of Wetaskiwin and as a tourist perspective, if I'm a tourist, because we have listeners and viewers from across Canada and around, uh, for some reason, strangely in Europe and in Ireland, good morning or whatever Irish is for good morning. Um, What are some of the stops? What are the hidden gems of the city of Wetaskiwin as a tourist I should be checking out or they should be checking out? So first would be, I think, the Heritage Museum downtown. Uh, the, the history that Wetaskiwin has, again, being one of the original cities of the province, um, the history here is phenomenal. The relationship that we're building with the Four Nations of Muspachis, um, all of those things tied into one to be able to go there and, and get a feel for what Wetaskiwin is. And it helps that it's on Main Street, which was revitalized, but again, has been a staple of the community for over a hundred years. And seeing some of the pictures when it was just a dirt road and horses and buggies that were were occupying the space. Uh, we were just a, a stop on the railroad for right for our start. Uh, so I think it's pretty cool to see that history, to see the old rail station is still downtown. Uh, some of the old buildings uh, that are still standing are, and which were tied into what our downtown looks like. Uh, our Heritage Museum for sure would be a, a, a place to go. But then Reynolds Alberta Museum, just right on the edge of the city, is huge. It's a world-class museum, ties into our agriculture background, and then our automotive and rail. Um, it's no like what very well known, I think. Um, the old cars cost less in Wetaskiwin. Uh, and having the auto mile, I think, is something that internationally we're known for and they might not be able to find us on a map but they've definitely heard that song or that jingle which is pretty cool for something that's 40 45 years old to still be recognizable now and I don't think you can have a lot of brands like that especially in a small community like ours that would stand the test of time that you would still be able to recognize that so pretty cool to to be a part of or or see the automile um the heritage museum Reynolds Alberta museum just outside of town we've got a railway museum and then all of our trails and our park, we've got a, a lake, it's called By the Lake Park, a uh, little over two kilometer trail that goes around it. It's beautiful. Sunrises and sunsets out there are absolutely amazing. Uh, and so just a few of the gems that we've got here in Wetaskiwin uh, to be able to come and see and understand why this is the city that you should be moving to or raising your family or being a part of. And you get out of it what you put into it. If you're getting involved with the service groups, if you're joining the Slow Pitch League, Kids are in soccer and hockey. It's a huge hockey community. It's growing as a soccer community. You'll build lifelong relationships here. And, and if that's my plug for why you need to move here, uh, I'm happy to have any kinds of conversations and dispel any myths or rumors that you might hear about what Wetaskiwin is. Well, well, you just took up the next question, but I'm, but I'm still going to ask it anyway, because I want to know your, your honest thoughts of your city. What makes the city of Wetaskiwin such a unique place to live, work, and play? I was talking about it earlier. It's our people. Our people are, again, they're amazing. You need something, they're there to help you. We've done fundraisers, um, raising over $100,000 for people in our community. And just that, that true, genuine sense of community and, and wanting to give back or be a part of something bigger than what you are. If, yeah, I... No question. I never have to hesitate on what makes Wetaskiwin so great. It's our people. So my last question to you is this. After a long day of council meetings, potentially uh, responding to fire calls, what's the one place in town in the city of Wetaskiwin that you can go and you can just decompress? What's the one place that you get away to just relax and decompress? Is it a park? Is it a business? Is it a walking trail? What is it for you? I, I have a few. Um, I'm not running as much as I used to, but I used to run quite a bit. So something that I love doing, we've got a great trail system here. Uh, I was actually contemplating a run once I was done this podcast here with you. 
Uh, so either walk or run uh, by the lake park is fantastic. Grab a lunch someplace and hit up a picnic table and, and hang out there for your lunch. Um, or, or I don't know why, but Wetaskiwin has a ton of restaurants and not chain driven restaurants, like family owned restaurants that have amazing food. And so any one of those at the end of the day, wrapping up and where am I going for supper tonight? Am I, you know, I'd, I don't want to say one without saying them all, but man, like you, you can't go wrong with any restaurant in town. I haven't had a bad meal or a bad experience. Uh, the people here love to serve and love seeing new faces in there. So again, reach out to me and I'll tell you where you need to go for food, depending on what you're feeling like, because we definitely have you covered. Well, uh, Mayor Tyler, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Great to meet you. And I appreciate the time to be able to, to brag about my community. <laughs> Always. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your Twitter handle, your Facebook page, your Instagram, your TikTok for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society. It helps our democracy and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. Keep talking.